First Kings chapter 17. The Bible tells us about the encounter of Elijah with the widow of Zarephath. If you start reading from verse number 8, the Bible tells us the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, that the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar, and see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil dry, run dry, until the day the Lord sent rain on the earth. And so she went her way, she went away, and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor, the, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which, is, which he spake by Elijah. I want you to put your hands there, Put a hole there, and then we're going to go, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, we'll start reading from verse number 16. Matthew 19, we'll start reading from verse number 16. The Bible tells us that, say, but behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may enter, that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one, but one, that is God. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother and you, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. What shall I do? Or what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had, for he had great possession. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in these two passages of scripture that we have just read, you see two different people. Two completely different people, two people who have totally different background, they have total different lifestyle, they are in different stations in life. Okay? These two different individuals appear different on the surface, but one thing they have one thing in common. And that one thing that they have in common is that they are concerned about their future. Both of them were concerned about their future. The widow of Zarephath was concerned about how to survive the famine. This young man is concerned about eternal life. How do I gain eternal life? So both of them were looking for a way to secure their future. That's what both of them were looking for. Okay. And so the very first thing I want you to see in the passage of scripture, those two passages of scripture that we've read, is number one, an encounter with a prophetic voice. Both of them had an encounter with a prophetic voice. Okay. The Bible tells us in that first John, first Kings chapter 17, that he, that, uh, Elijah arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to Zarephath, at the gate of the Zarephath, he did, he saw a woman gathering sticks, an encounter with that particular woman. So both of them had this encounter with the prophetic voice. Okay? The woman, sorry, the, 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 the young man, the young man had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said, Behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do to have eternal life? So both of them had an encounter with somebody who spoke a prophetic word into their life. Number two, I want you to notice that both of them received an unusual instruction. Both of them. Okay? The woman, the widow of Zarephath, received this crazy instruction from Elijah that says, 
I don't have food. You are just told me I don't have food, but you are asking you to make one for me first. It's not just saying prepare for all of us to eat at once. No, no. See, prepare it first and give it to me first. And then go and do for yourself. What about if I don't have any other thing? But well, that's the story for another day. So both of them received this unusual instruction. This young man came to the Lord Jesus Christ and was telling him, I want to go to heaven. And the Lord Jesus Christ inst- instructed the young man, he said, go and sell everything you have. Come on, man. Is that how expensive it is to get to heaven? To sell everything? Okay. He said, go sell everything. Then not just I give it to the poor and then come and follow me. I have no house, I have no place, no job, nothing. We are trusting God for feeding. I have everything wanted. Okay, that's the story for another, like I said. So both of them receive this very, very unusual instruction. But the last thing I want you to notice is their response. The two of them had two completely different responses to the unusual instruction that they received. Okay? The Bible says that that woman, the widow of Zarephath, in verse number 15, Second, first Kings chapter 17, the Bible says that she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. As crazy as that instruction is, she did, she did according to the word of Elijah. But by the time you get to the case of this young man, the Bible says that the young man had that saying. He went away sorrowful because he had a great possession. The woman followed the instruction of Elijah as Elijah had commanded she did accordingly. But that woman, but that young man went away, left the presence of the Almighty of the Lord Jesus Christ sorrowful with a very strong indication that, uh, 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 I'm not doing this. Okay? He did say it, but the Bible said that he was sorrowful and he left and we never heard about him again. As a result of their individual response, so that crazy prophetic voice that they had received, as a result of their individual response to the, to the instruction that they received, the Bible makes us to understand that that woman secured her future throughout that particular period of time. Because of the obedience to one instruction, no matter how crazy that instruction was, go and give it to me first, and then you will see what happens. She followed that instruction and she secured her future, three and a half years, everybody was dying, but that woman was secure because of her response to a prophetic voice. The second thing you will notice that for unfortunately for that young man, his response also to the prophetic voice of our Lord Jesus Christ, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. His response to that instruction made sure that he, became, he was erased from the pages of scripture because he never heard from him again. And that was the end of the story for him. This tells us that if we are interested in securing our own future, if we are interested in seeing the plan and the purpose of God fulfilled in our own life, we must be, it's a function of how we respond to the instruction that God gives us. The instruction that we receive every day. Instruction from scripture. Instruction from a section like this where we are ministering to one another. Instruction that we hear from the strong, from, from, from our time alone with the Almighty God, how we respond to that instruction, you know, determines whether we are going to secure our future or we are going to be erased like that young man that came to the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it takes obedience to the instructions of God for us to see the fulfillment of the promise of God in our lives. It takes obedience to the Word of God. It takes obedience to the instructions of God for us to be able to secure the future that God has in store for us. And you all know, from the beginning of this particular month, we have been talking about the idea of looking, you know, of the cost of securing the future. We started by saying that the cost of securing our future is the cost of abiding in the presence of the Almighty God. We went on to say that it's not just abiding in the presence of the Lord, but you abide in prayer. You remain, you talk to Him, you have a conversation with Him. You open the line of communication with the Almighty God if you want to secure your future. Not only that, last week our pastor spoke to us and he told us about living for the glory of the Almighty God. He said that's one of the ways in which we secure the glory, secure our future. But this morning we're closing out this series and we're talking about securing our future by, you know, abiding in obedience to the Word of God. Securing our future by, you know, by abiding in obedience. And, you know, and let us start by asking ourselves what we mean by, what do we mean by obedience? When we talk about the abiding in this, obe- uh, abiding in obedience, what are we talking about? Okay? So what is obedience? Simple is, is that, but, you know, the basic definition of obedience is for somebody to follow instructions. That's it. Following instructions. For somebody to be in compliance, that's what it means to be in obedience. So when I tell you move, you move. When the Lord says jump, you jump. You don't begin to ask the Lord Almighty, why should I jump? That's no longer obedience. That's questioning Him. 
But the Lord gives instruction, you follow. That's what it simply means. Following the instructions of the Almighty God. So when we talk about abiding in obedience, what are we talking about? What does it mean to abide in obedience? To abide in obedience, we're simply talking about uh, living a life of love and, and a devotion to God by obeying His instructions. Living a life of love and the devotion to the Almighty God by obeying His command. When we talk about abiding in obedience, we are talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about making obedience, a, obedience to God a lifestyle. In other words, you are living every day, your lifestyle every day is a lifestyle of obedience. Whatever he tells you to do, you don't question, you don't analyze, you don't argue, you don't push it up and down, you just obey. It's a lifestyle of obedience. May, you know, when we talk about uh, abiding obedience, we're talking about making obedience to God non-negotiable in our lives. That's what it means. Making obedience non-negotiable in our lives. If the Lord says, this is it, you don't question. We follow. That's what obedience is. The Bible tells us in John chapter 15, if you read from verse number 9, he was trying to describe the relationship that he had with his father and the same relationship he wants us to have with him. He says, as the father loved me, I have also loved you. He said, abide in my love. How do you abide in my love? He said, if you keep my commandments, that means if you remain in obedience to me, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just that I have kept my father's commitment and I abide in his love. So in other words, for all when we're talking about abiding in obedience, we're talking about keeping the commandment of the Almighty God so that we can continue to have fellowship with the Almighty God. The same thing if you are looking at the people that you have a relationship with. Maybe a son or a daughter, an uncle, you know, or a nephew or a cousin or whatever. If you are if that person follows the instruction that you give to them, you will find out that your relationship with that person will be different from one that continues to question every word that comes out of your mouth. So Jesus is saying, if you keep my commandment, you will abide in my love, just like I have kept my father's commandment and I abide in love. So you see, when we talk about abiding in obedience, we're talking about living a life of love and devotion to God by following and obeying his commandment. And that is why, you know, and that is why it is very important as a believer who wants the Almighty God to be you know, is refuge. Who wants to be able to see God move on his behalf? That individual must be able to learn to make obedience a lifestyle. Now, why does our abiding in obedience important for securing our future? Why? Why is it important that you must obey God so that your future is secured in Christ? What is that about obedience, what is it about obedience that secures the future for the people of God? Why? The reason why abiding in obedience is central to securing our desired future is because our, our obedience guarantees our access not just to God, but to all that God has. If I give an example again, a family member who is very close to you, does everything that you do, does that person, will that person have difficulty accessing you? No. It's your favorite cousin, or your favorite niece, or your favorite, you know, you are, we're not supposed, you, you are not, because we're supposed to treat everybody equal, we're not supposed to have a favorite son or daughter. But you do know that there are some of our daughters that will like more than the others. Eh? We know. The one that will obey you, you prefer. The one you don't like, you won't say you don't like them, you just don't like to see them a lot. When they show up, you say, oh, what do you want right now? But that's a story for another day. The point I'm making is that abiding in obedience not only secures our access to God, is secures our access to everything that God has. Because as soon as you are able to enter his presence, what else is left? If you enter into the house of your father, what else? If you are able to get past the gate, get into the main house, what else is left? Everything is open to you. And so obedience, the reason why obedience makes it, you know, secures your future is because it gives you access to God and access to everything that God has. That's number one. Why is obedience important? Obedience is important in securing our future because it guarantees our productivity. It guarantees our productivity. If you read John chapter 15 verse number 4, the Bible says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. In other words, as long as you continue to obey him, as long as you continue to walk with him, he continues to release that which is required for you to continue to be productive. Alright? It's just like you have been responsible for sending one of your cousins or your nephews to school. And that child continues to give you reports. 
Uncle, this is what I did today. Uncle, this is what is coming. This is the, I said, this is my result from the test. This is what is going on. We are going on the field trip. It keeps giving you day by day update of what is happening. It continues to communicate with you. I'm calling you not because I need anything. I just want to see how you are doing. I hope Madame is fine. I hope Uncle Auntie is fine. I hope the children. And that person continues to reach out to you. Are you going to forget sending that money? No way. You won't. Because you have that communication with that person. That person continues to maintain that relationship with you. They follow the instruction. You tell that person, now that you're in school, don't join any gang go. Don't go with these people. Don't do any night nice party. Face your booth. Go to the library. You are giving all that instruction and that boy or that girl is following that instruction. Will it be difficult for you to be able to send money to that person? No. But if they are sending, you are, you are responsible for training a child. That child is in college. You are telling him, don't go somewhere. And you open Facebook and it's doing yoga. Okay, you begin to wonder. I think I'm giving you hundred dollars. That was cut this thing to fifty. It is enemy. It is just common sense. That is the, the way. You, the, the more you abide in obedience, the more number one you have access to him and access to his resources. The number two, it guarantees your continued productivity because you continue to receive the flow of grace from him. And then finally, it guarantees your fruitfulness. Because the more you are connected to the Father, the more the grace of God flows into your life and the more you produce. Look at what it says in verse number 5 of John chapter 15. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. In other words, as long as you are connected with him, he continues to give you the source of life and your life continues to produce results. That is how this thing works. You have, you know, your obedience to the Lord God Almighty, number one, guarantees the fact that you can come into His presence. You can have access to His resources. It guarantees your fruitfulness. It guarantees your productivity. And so you see, the life that will be characterized by access to the Lord, the life that is given access to the resource of heaven, the life that is given productivity, the life that is given fruitfulness, that life must be a life that obeys the Word of God. You cannot Walk in total disobedience and expect the grace of God to continue to flow. That's what Paul was talking about when he wrote in the scripture. When he was writing to the Roman church. He said we cannot continue in sin and expect grace to abound. It doesn't work like that. You cannot continue to disobey the Almighty God. You cannot continue to put your hand in his eye. You cannot continue to chop your finger in his face and expect him to continue to bless you. And be like Santa Claus. Oh, boys will be boys. No, no. Boys are not going to be boys. It's either you obey him and enjoy his blessings or you disobey him and then go do for your own. So you see, the man or the woman who will continue to enjoy the blessings of heaven and secure his future must be a man that is ready to obey the voice of the Almighty God. And before we go on, I want to understand that there are different levels of obedience. Different levels of obedience. Okay? But I'll group them into two broad categories. And the first category is what I call the conditional obedience. Conditional obedience. The obedience that is based on God, you do this for me, I will do this for you. We do every one of us do it. Oh Lord, when you bless me, I'll begin to pray, I'll begin to worship you more. Okay? If he doesn't bless you, that means you're not worshiping him. And what is your worship? What, 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 how do you think that your worship makes a difference to the Almighty God? If you don't worship him, does he stop to become God? No. Jesus himself said, if you don't rise up and worship him, he can command the stones to rise up and worship him. So, whether you worship him or you don't worship him, it makes no difference to him. He is still God. But that is what is called conditional obedience, and many of us do it. Lord, unless you bless me, because of this will not. It doesn't make any difference to God. It is you that it blesses when you do what you're supposed to do. That is the first one. Obedience is a conditional obedience. When we talk to the Almighty God, I will say, do this, and then I will do this. It's like we're trying to have a transaction with the Almighty God. Okay? The second part, the second type of obedience is what I call unconditional obedience. And like you know, it's the opposite of the condition. It's, it's, that is obedience without precondition. That is what Job was saying. Job said, and even if you slay me, I will still praise you. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you give me something or you don't give me something. It doesn't matter whether you heal me or you don't heal me. It doesn't matter whether you provide or you don't provide, I will still praise you. That's what the three Hebrew children were doing. They say, even if you slay us, we will still not obey you and follow the Almighty God. That is unconditional love. That is unconditional obedience to the Almighty God. Even when you say, even if he slays me, I will yet trust him. Now, seeing that, you know, now you can imagine that God prefers what? He prefers the unconditional obedience. That is the one that attracts his attention. That is the one that attracts his blessing. And the question now is, what motivates an individual or what will motivate an individual to obey God unconditionally? 
What is it that will be in the life of an individual that will make him say, Lord, I will serve you regardless of what is going on around you? What motivates unconditional obedience? Look at Genesis 22. Genesis 22. We all know the story. The Bible says God woke up one morning and God wanted Isaac for barbecue. Okay? Told, I, told Abraham, go and sacrifice your son and you are going to do it as a burnt offering. I, Abraham did not question. We all know the story. He took the boy, went there, was about to slay him before the Lord Almighty stopped him. Okay? But if you read that Genesis 22, it did not tell us why Abraham was obeying God without question. It didn't tell us. But you will find the reason why Abraham did what he did in the book of Romans chapter 4. If you read Romans chapter 4, reading from verse number 20, the Bible says, He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now look at verse 21. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And that means, the question is, why was Abraham motivated to sacrifice his son? The reason very clearly from that Romans chapter 4 is that Abraham's obedience was motivated by the conviction, the persuasion, the assurance that God is able to do what he has promised to do. In other words, he knows. God had told him that he was going to be the father of many nations. God had told him that he was going to have a son. And God had given him that son in old age. He knew that he was not capable of having a child when he had that child. He knew that Abraham, his wife, was already dead medically when it comes to having children. But the Abraham was there, but Sarah was still able to produce. Now God is asking for that same boy. Abraham reasoned in his mind. He said, if God can give me this boy at the age of a hundred, if God can, you know, can give me when I had no hope, I am very sure that what he told me that I'm going to be the father of many nations will still happen. I will give him this son because I know he's able to be the son of He was convinced that God was faithful. He was convinced that God had the ability to do what he promised to do. Because of the Abraham's conviction, Abraham was motivated to obey God without question. Okay? Abraham's unconditional obedience was motivated by the conviction, the persuasion, the confidence that God is able to do what he says he is what he's going to do. And so you see, it, you know, for, you know, his unshakable belief, his unshakable confidence in the Almighty God is what gave him that ability to continue to do what he said he was going to do. And so, my brothers and sisters, the question to all is what will motivate us to be able to obey God unquestionably? What is it that will help us to be able to get to the point where we don't question God when we are obeying Him? Number one, for us to be able to obey God without question, for us to follow God unconditionally, it must start with a strong conviction. That means we must be fully persuaded that what God said He will do, He will do. Okay? You wake up in the morning and you put your hands in a project. Many of us know how we are in this place. And then we begin to put our hands in a project like this. If we are not convinced, we will not do it. Okay? If God is giving you instruction to do something, you look around. If you are not convinced, you will not do it. The widow of Zarephath that the Elijah said, go and first of all, cook whatever you have left and bring it to me. And then you will have more. If that widow is not convinced, she will not do it. She won't. I've given you this example before and I'll give it again. If you are not convinced that the chair you are sitting on right now has the capacity to carry your weight, you will not sit on it. Abi, you won't. Because you don't want to fall down. You don't want people to say, ah, sorry, sorry. you don't want people to do that to you. You don't want to be embarrassed in the midst of people. So what do you do? You say, oh no, I prefer standing. It's because you are not sure that that people will carry you. So for us to be able to obey God, to be motivated to obey God unconditionally, we must start, it must start with conviction in our heart. Being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform. Abraham now was willing to lay Isaac on the altar. If you are not convinced, you will not release it. Okay? You won't. Number two, our motivation to obey God unconditionally must not only be rooted in conviction, it must be rooted in our knowledge of Him. Who am I dealing with? I'm dealing with the Almighty God, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. The one who is not a man that is to lie or the son of man that is to repent. Whatever He says He will do, He will do it. If you know that, it becomes very easy to follow Him. But if you don't know that, or you are not convinced about that, you will never obey him. It's a very simple thing. It's just like you have a friend 
He has called upon you maybe 10 years ago. He said he had a particular issue that he needed a particular amount of money that he will give it to you tomorrow. And then he took the money from you. Tomorrow was 10 years ago. He has not given it to you. Another problem came about five years ago. He said, oh, somebody came. I needed something. My, and then you gave him money. He said he was going to give you. That means that two tomorrows. One was 10 years ago. One is five years ago. Another tomorrow now happened yesterday. Are you going to release the money again? No way. Because you know that the tomorrow of 10 years has not come. The tomorrow of five years ago has not come. Definitely the tomorrow of yesterday too will not come. Okay? Because you know this individual. You know his character. There are certain things that you will never do for that person. Because you know that person. Okay? There are some people who say, good morning. You will open the window. Okay, I'll come back. All right, and then answer, good morning. And there are some of you who say, good morning. Ah, the Lord will help you. The point I'm trying to make is this. For you to obey God unconditionally, it has to be, number one, born out of conviction. Then number two, born out of the knowledge, of your knowledge of the Almighty God. What you know about Him. What you know about His character. What you know about the things He has done in the past. When you know what the Lord has done, it is easier for you to follow the instruction he gave you. That's why David said, I have been young, I am now, I'm old, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. Why? Because he knows that God always takes care of the righteous. He knows that. That's why he's able to do that. My brothers and sisters, this thing is very simple. I'm not saying it's easy, I say it's simple. Okay? It is simple because if you trust somebody, it is easy to do what that person asks you to do. You trust the bank will not steal your money. That's why you take your money and go and put it in the bank. A person you have never met before. Pastor say you go and see Dr. XYZ. The doctor puts some tablets of chalk in your hand. He says you should take it. It will cure your headache. You don't know that guy. You don't know his family. You don't know what he has been through, whether he has been a true professor or not. But he put that paper in your hand. You went to the pharmacy. You picked up that thing. They wrote the name, whatever they wrote, they say it's Tyrano. You believe them. You put it in your hand. Is that what Everything is a function of your conviction, of your faith. That's why you obey the doctor. That's why you obey the banker. That's why you obey the investment person. That's why you obey whoever is giving you instruction that you follow without even knowing them. Now God is saying for you to walk with me. I need you to have that conviction. I need you number two to have that. I need you to have to be rooted in knowledge. God is not saying follow me stupidly. And that's why I tell people Christianity does not mean that you are stupid. No. It means that you are using your head based on the information that God has given to you. So unconditional faith, unconditional obedience starts with the conviction, number two. It is rooted in knowledge. Number two is strengthened by trust. What God has done in the past. You trust that he will not go back. You trust that he's not changing. You trust that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so you do what he has you to do. And then finally, it is settled by his faithfulness. And that is why you are not troubled. That is why in the midst of storm you can sleep. That is why after you have done something, you are not troubled and say, ah, what have I done wrong? Because you know that he's faithful. I've told you a story before. We went to a particular uh, conference and the Lord Almighty spoke to our heart and said, okay, give, you know, give your, your one month salary. I said, no problem. So we wrote the check, we gave it out. We put the date. They said we could post date it. So we post the check. You know what these people did? They cut the check the next day. Which means I am out of a month's salary and I didn't plan for the eight. They cashed the check the next day. They emptied our account. In that particular case, if you don't believe in the faithfulness of God to provide, oh my God, you will not only cost the pastor, you will cost the person that put money there. You say, what do you people? That's why people don't give money in church. I told you, you say I should pass, I post it. I posted it. You have cleared my account now. How do you want me to do? You are the people that are giving church a bad name. You, the, you will say all sorts of things. I was tempted to do so, but that's a story for another day. The point, the point I'm making is this. Unless you believe in the faithfulness of God to be able to meet you at the point of your need, you will not do certain things. Unless you trust that God is able to fulfill his word, you will not do certain things. If there is no peace in your heart when you have done something, your faith is not yet complete. Because one of the things you will find is that you, you say he gives his beloved rest. When you trust in the Almighty God and you are confident that God is able to do what He's able to do and you have obeyed Him, there's a rest in your spirit. That's why Jesus can sleep in the middle of the storm. Alright? Let me, let's leave that one and let's move on. The idea is this. 
unconditional obedience has to be based on your conviction, based on your knowledge of the Almighty God, based on your ability to trust Him, and also based on the faithfulness of the Almighty God. Now, seeing what motivates unconditional obedience, the question now is, is this. What strengthens our resolve? What makes you convinced that this is what I must do? That I must obey God? What strengthens our resolve towards obedience? What makes you say, okay, regardless of what everybody is saying around me, this is what I'm going to do because God told me. What strengthens it? What strengthens our resolve? Okay? What strengthens our resolve to obey God is number one, our ability to see what God is showing you. Your ability to see where God is taking you. Your ability to see the provisions that God has made available for us. The Bible tells us something about Abraham. If you read Abraham, sorry, if you read Genesis chapter 13, after Lot has separated from Abraham, the Lord spoke unto Abraham. He said, lift up your eyes. Lot has taken what he think was good. He said, lift up your eyes. Look towards your north, your east, and the west, and everything. He said, for all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants. So when Abraham comes out, because he knows that God is faithful. Because he knows that God cannot lie. He looks at the light. He says, oh, this one I'm mad. You guys are just staying there for now. He is convinced that God has given it all to me. And that is why he's able to obey. When you see where God is taking you, it's easy for you to follow. Okay? When you see where God is taking you, when you see what God is able to do for you, it's easy for you to obey him. The Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has he entered into the heart of men. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. He said, for God has revealed us, revealed them to us by his spirit. In other words, when the Lord opens your eyes to see where he's taking you, it's easy for you to follow why are you not afraid in your own house when there is no light? Why? Because you know where everything is. Right? You can close your eyes and walk through your own house. You know where everything is. You can walk into your known future when the Lord has shown you where you are going. It's easy. You have that confidence. But if you don't know, if you have never seen it, you have no idea what what's behind the door, fear will come in. And it's very difficult for you to obey God when you don't know what's on the other side. But when you are, when the Lord has given you an idea of where you are going, when He has shown you what is on the other side, when He has told you the possibility that you can encounter, you can't question what you see with your own eyes. Okay? Somebody wakes up one day and say, you come, 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 come. Come into the, open the bedroom and say, okay, see, this, this is yours. You just go to school, graduate, and all this is yours. What would you, what do you think will happen to that child? He will read because he knows something is waiting. I remember there was a time when after graduation we went for an interview in one of the oil companies in Nigeria. I see we were all sweating trying to prepare for that interview and there's one boy. That boy was super confident. And we we're talking to him and I said, eventually I asked him, why are you so, you are acting as if you are not coming for the interview. He said, yes, yeah, because I know. I know I'm going to get a job. I said, how do you know? He said, because my uncle has already spoken to the manager, the director. <laughs> so, so what's your problem? <laughs> my uncle has already spoken to the director. So the only said, yeah, yeah, you guys are the one party. I'm not. I'm just here to tell the guy I'm here. We did the interview with everything. I didn't get a job. But I went back again to look for a plan for another job. I saw this boy coming out. At that time, that was when they were giving out data executives. You know, I'm talking about uh, when, when you work for the unlimited petroleum company. That is then. This is way back in 1991, This guy was walking out of that company with a, with a key to the data executive as one of their people. So when you already know, when you have seen the end of the story, <laughs> why should you be bothered? And the Lord Bible tells us, He said, He's the one that knows the end from the very beginning. And so He shows you, This is where I'm taking you. Just follow me. If you have seen that, it's easy to obey. Number two, how, what is, what, we, what gives us, you know, our desire to obey the Almighty God is also strengthened when you are able to hear the instruction that He's telling you. When you wake up and say, No, don't do this, do this. When he begins to give you instruction on where to go, not just seeing, but hearing the voice of the Almighty God, it turns everything around. He said, therefore, take heart. That was when Paul the Apostle was involved in a shipwreck. The Bible tells us that the people were all panicking. They wanted to jump the ship. They wanted to abandon the ship. Paul the Apostle said, no. Because when I was praying yesterday, the Spirit of the Almighty God was with me. An angel of the Almighty God stood with me. He said that there, there will be no loss of life. He said, therefore, take heart. For I believe that it will be just as it was told to me. He has heard it already. God has already told him what it's going to be. Nobody's 
going to die. As long as they remain in this street, they will be fine. He said, so don't jump. Don't do what everybody is doing. Don't live your life based on uh, you know, uh, what's the word for this thing in English? Uh, you you uh, got the time. Don't gamble with your life. You know? Don't begin to say, okay, let me try this, let me try this, because everybody's, no, 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 say, follow the instruction that I give you. When you follow the instruction, you've heard the instruction, it's easy to obey. So what makes obedience easy? Number one is when you see where God is taking you. Number two, when you are able to hear the instruction that is given you. Number three, the desire for God, your desire to obey God is strengthened. When faith, when we have faith to believe what He is telling us. It's not just enough to hear and to see. You must believe that this is what God is showing you. You must believe that this is where God is taking me. When you have faith to believe, it changes everything. Okay? It changes everything. And then finally, what our desire to obey God is strengthened when we have the courage to engage that word of God. The courage to be able to engage the word of God. God says, do X, Y, Z. The courage to be able to do that thing is what gives you the ability to obey. Look at what happened when the Bible tells us that Jesus did his first miracle. They came to the Lord Jesus Christ and they said, they came to the mother and they said, we need what the wine is finished. The mother went to Jesus and he told those people, he said, anything he tells you to do, do it. Okay? And if you read that John chapter 2 verse 1, from verse 5, Jesus began to give some very crazy instruction. Really crazy instruction. He said, fill the water pot with water. We say we don't get wine. We are talking about water. Fill the water pot with water. Okay, we have filled it. Now take that water and go and give it to the governor. Oh God, they wanted wine, not water. Take the water and give it to the, to the governor. And they did. You must be willing to engage that word. Look at what Peter did. The Bible says that they fished all night. Expert fisherman. But Jesus Christ said, take that net and drop it on the other side. He said, we have fished all night that we have caught nothing. He said, but at your word, I am willing to engage that instruction and take that net and put it on the other side. Until we are willing, the courage to engage the word of God. God said it. Let me even try it. If you are not willing to try to do what God has said to do, you will never be able to do it. That's basically what I'm saying. The courage to engage. It might be risky. Sometimes you may fail. But until you try, you never know. So please understand that it is not enough to see the future. It is not enough to hear the word of prophecy. It's not enough for someone to lay hands upon us. It's not enough for us to be anointed and receive a word of knowledge, a word of revelation, a prophetic denial. It is not enough to receive all that. It is not enough to hear. For us to be able to see the fulfillment of God's purpose in our life, we must have the courage to engage that word. Do what the word is asking you to do. Step out of that comfort zone. We must have the courage to obey God's instruction for the fulfillment of God's promises. Let me give another example before we close here this morning. Exodus chapter 12. Many of us know the story. Israel was about to leave, was about to leave the, 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 the land of captivity, right? Moses and the night they were about to leave gave them a particular instruction. Look at Exodus chapter 12. If you start reading from verse 21, the Bible said, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your family and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel of the two sides, well, two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning for the Lord will pass forth to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel, he on the, on the, on the, on the two sides of the post, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. Simple instruction. Take the blood, put it in the basin, strike the door post, stay in time. Open it. That's it. Now, if the children of Israel, for some reason, believe that Mo- they believe what Moses told them, they took the oil, they, they, they took the uh, what do you call it? They took the uh, the, 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 uh, the the story that Moses told them about uh, taking the blood, uh, marking their house. And if for some reason they refuse to follow that instruction, what do you think will happen to them? All of them will burn. All of them will die. Okay. If they, they might believe the story, Moses is a man of God. He has shared a lot of things. He has done a lot of miracles. But this one is a waste of time. I mean, what, 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 what is God? Okay? What is God going to do for us? Okay? We are going to save that our house. So it's going to kill everybody. It's going to leave us just because we put blood there. Come on, man. You should not believe the superstition. All you people. That's what I'm telling you. All this Christian pastor. I don't know what's wrong with you people. Okay? You believe that. What, what, you're putting blood on your door. What is it going to do for you? If you don't do them, you will see. 
The point I'm making is that they might say all those things, they might rationalize. If they don't follow that instruction, they will end up like the Egyptians. Okay? The same thing happens to us. We can dream. We can hear instruction. We can remain under the powerful anointing. We can receive the word of knowledge. We can do all those things. If we fail to act on God's instruction for our lives, we will not see the result. This is not magic. It's the word of God. If you fail to obey what God is telling us to do, securing our desired destiny will end up becoming a mirage because it will not happen. You are not following the instruction. Obedience is central to securing our future. That's basically what I'm saying. Seeing the importance of obedience, the question is why in the world do people find it difficult to obey? Why do they find it difficult to obey? Many of us find it difficult to obey because of the fear of man. What are they going to say? Oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be like those pretty Christians. Oh, I don't want them to know that I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a what? No, because of the fear of man. And the Bible says that the fear of man does what? Brings snare. When we are afraid of what people will say, we will not be able to obey God. Number two, when there is doubt and unbelief, doubting ourselves, doubting the Almighty God, not believing ourselves, not believing what God is saying, we will never be able to obey God. Number three, we find it difficult to obey God when we simply don't know the God that we are serving. The Bible says that they that need our God, they shall be strong and they will do exploits. Which means if you don't know your God, you are going to be weak and you will be exploited. That's what it means. You know, I've always told you when you read the Bible, read it forward and read it backward. You'll probably get a better meaning when you read it backward. Those who know their God will be strong and they will be exploited. Which means those who don't know their God, they will be weak and they will be exploited. So the point we are making here, to be able to obey, a lot of people are not being able to obey God because they don't know the God they are serving. They lack the basic understanding of the nature of the God that they are serving. And then finally, most people do not obey God because they don't want to pay the uncomfortable price of obedience. Obedience is not comfortable. Okay? You are preparing your last meal. One raggedy pastor comes and says, give me what you are preparing for you and yourself. That's what, that's what we're saying. All these pastors, they are writing their debt and everything, collecting offering. The food that I prepare for myself to eat, you are wanting me to take, you say, God tell you to come. Which kind of God will tell you to come and do something like that? Eh? God is not a wicked God. You begin all those philosophies and you put it there. Meanwhile, <laughs> the Lord is giving you an opportunity to secure your future. You say, no. Okay, eat your lunch. At the, end of, at the end of the day, you will die in the three and a half years. But thank God that woman was able to pay the uncomfortable price of obedience. And that uncomfortable price that she paid secured three and a half years for her. So please understand, there are times when the Spirit of the Lord is speaking. That is why you should grow as a believer. That's why we thank God for the Bible study that we did this morning. You should mature as a believer. So that you can tell the difference when the pastor is talking his own jazz and when it's actually speaking by the influence of the Spirit of God, you will know. Okay? You are a child of God. He should tell you. Alright? The child of God. God will not ask you for what you don't have. Huh? Okay? He will always tell you to start from where you are. Okay? He will tell you to start from where you are. If you read the instructions of Christ, it's very simple. Start from where you are. But I say all that to say this. If you grow and you are mature as a Christian, no pastor will be able to put you and begin to mess with you. No pastor will give you, yeah, the Spirit of God is telling me yeah, there's somebody here who's going to give me 100,000. Oh God, there's nobody get 100,000 here. The Spirit of God cannot tell you to get 100,000 for people who don't have 100,000. Eh? God is not, a, he's not, he's not mocking something. If they have 100,000, they will give you. But if you are mature enough, you will tell. You will know. And the Bible says that out of the mouth of one or two, he says everybody is coming. In your spirit, there will be that establishment that you and this person is telling you to do. There will be a resonance. It will agree with your spirit and give to work with. So please, for you not to be taken as an exploit, you're taking as what you call it, a prey in the hands of a minister, you need to grow yourself. You need to mature yourself. Learn to hear the voice of God. Understand what the Bible is saying. Know the God that you are serving. So that when people like me come and will say, yes, God is saying, yes, somebody's going to buy a car for the pastor. Ah, ah, you must buy a car for the pastor. Yes, 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 yes I can see. You say, what? God, nobody's buying you a car here. <laughs> but that's a story for another day. The point I'm making is this. Many don't obey God because they don't want to pay the price, the, the uncomfortable price of obedience. But only those who do so 
those are the people who are able to see God move on their behalf. Only those who do so, those are the only people that see God turn things around for them. Only those who pay the price of obedience, those are the people that enter into the promise of the Almighty God. The question for us this morning before we go is this. What will be, you know, what is it that is going to stop us from obeying the Almighty God? What will stop you, what will stop me from paying the price of obedience to secure the future? That God has promised to us. Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.